I have my Seattle coffee in hand. Nice. So I just want to let everybody know that this is part of my podcast for Mindful Social Chat, and it will be on my podcast on Spreaker. It'll also be on YouTube, and you'll be able to see the replay here or on our website at mindfulsocialmarketing.com. And this morning, I'm really excited to have Mark Babbitt, one of those people that I rarely run into in person. And every time we see each other, we're like, oh, I'm so glad to see you. And that's the beauty of social media for me, is that I would have no idea, well, I, I would know Mark, but I would have no idea who he was in person until I actually met him because of a social event that we were at. So I'm just so glad you could be here, Mark. Why don't you tell people a little bit about you and what it is that you do with U-Turn? So, so U-Turn is a community that helps uh, young talent um, rise up into the workforce, perhaps a little bit more gracefully than they would otherwise, thinking that a degree is, is enough. Um, and, uh, and so we talk a lot about the human side of, of personal development. So uh, internships, mentorship, uh, networking, personal branding, that kind of thing. And then, as you know, I'm also a president over at Switch and Shift, which is a leadership site that uh, focuses a lot on social leadership versus industrial age leadership practices. Uh, and um, and we're also launching a third community, uh, Forward Heroes. will be will be coming along this year. Uh, what U-Turn is to college students, Forward Heroes will be for our military veterans. I'm really excited about that in particular. I think that's really amazing. I work with some uh, military veterans at one of the universities that I teach at and do some mentoring there. And it's really amazing how disorienting it can be when you come back and you don't know where you're going to go. You don't know what you're going to do. You take whatever direction people tell you you need to take, but you don't know how to get there. And I, I think we really need to give them a hell of a lot more help. So well, kudos to you. Well, thank you. And, that, and that's what we're setting out to do. You know, um, that's what's fun about about this this new way of doing business is we can we can help launch these communities and they just kind of take off on their own and all of a sudden we're all mentoring and we're all helping and we're all we're all leading a cause and it's it's, it's a fun way to make a living. Yeah, it really is. It's very cool. So we're here to talk to leadership and maybe that's kind of a good way to segue into what you mean by social leadership. Well, social leadership is is people think it's social media. And and I guess in some ways it is because we certainly use social media to amplify our personal and corporate brands, but it's so much more than that. It's 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 about active listening. It's mm. it's about being mindful or self-aware of where you are right now in this moment and and putting the damn device down and actually having a conversation and and it's, you know, it's something we've lost. It's, you know, we went from the industrial age where managers were never trained to listen. They're trained to be bold and decisive and autocratic and, and have all the answers. And now, and now we're asking leaders to actually listen and, and collect the wisdom in the room and, and be present where they are at that moment. And it's, it's a much different approach to, to leadership than most of us have been taught in business school or learn from our parents or learn from our mentors. And, and so it's, it's quite a transition. Yeah, it is. And it, it's really a much more human way to work. And I think that's it kind of goes against what we've been taught, you know, that a leader is really strong and, you know, they're always commanding and maybe it's something we get from the military idea of what a leader is. But when you bring it into, you know, the real world, where everybody else is, how does that work? And how do you make that transition? If you're an old school um, leader, how can you start to make that transition? Well, here's what's really funny about that is even our military leadership, which, you know, by reputation is certainly autocratic and, and loud. Uh, you know, we think of the boot camp drill sergeant, but uh, being a veteran myself, I'll tell you the best thing about military leadership is it's mission first and egos don't, don't, play in the game and and we're all focused on accomplishing whatever we've set out to do together and and that's a that's a major part of, of today's social leadership is let's forget about let's forget about what's in it for me let's forget about who gets the credit and let's just let's just get the damn job done and um it's 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 a, a you know it's it's so different as you said than what we've been taught yeah absolutely different than what we've been taught but i think you know it, it does make 
there's a, there's a lot of reasons that, you know, some leaders have to be really directive and, you know, but when you're dealing with a corporation and now that we're seeing more corporations thinking about mindfulness as a part of the corporate ethic, I think maybe that is helping us a lot, um, you know, because they're teaching a lot of different types of mindfulness. Well, they're not just teaching it, Janet, they're hiring for it now, which is, which is exciting, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's fun to look at the companies that are really getting this right and seeing that they're not just, they're not just helping their current managers and leaders, um, you know, rise up and, and be more self-aware, more mindful of the present, but they're, they're hiring for it. They're deliberately saying, look, for my next CIO, I want somebody who is socially aware, an active listener. My, uh, you know, they, they, they not only expect themselves to be mindful, they expect their, those they lead to be mindful. Mm -hmm. um, we want them to be managers instead of uh, mentors, sorry, instead of managers. And, and we're, and we're actually starting to build teams around these principles. And that's, that's what's exciting to me is you see this huge shift in in what we expect from our leaders from the board of directors down and it's it's making a big impact now do you think that that's driven by and i hate to say the word millennials but i'm going to do you think that it's driven by a mindset that expects more from their leaders than in the past that's a great question and, and i um, and, and i answer that one a lot and i'm always torn because i don't you know, it's hard to lump 81 million people of one generation into one composite person. Yeah. But I'll tell you, they they are, um, or at least they seem to be the first generation, the first group of people to ever give themselves permission to enjoy work mm -hmm. and to expect to be um, part of the conversation, not just do what they're told, but actually be, you know, contribute to the solution. And I think, and I think that's a pretty exciting thing. And I, I, you know, I look back now at my my twenties and I go, "What the hell was wrong with me? I just did what I was told. I was an idiot, right?" And and so you know, and I was an engineer in Silicon Valley with a great job, living under the palm trees. You know, I had the life, and it sucked, and I hated it, mm -hmm. and I felt and I felt guilty because I seemingly had everything as a small kid from Oregon, now living you know in Silicon Valley and having this great position at this great company, and I hated it. What's wrong with me? And and it wasn't fulfilling work. It was it was showing you know the same commute, same car, same parking spot, same cubicle, same front door, same everything, mm -hmm. every day for eight years. And it's like this just sucks. And now millennials are going. You know what? When it sucks, I'm moving on. And and when my manager sucks, I'm moving on. Mm -hmm. And when the company sucks, I'm going to move on. And well, we didn't have that attitude. At, you know, guys my age in the twenties, we didn't have that attitude. We we hung on for everything. We you know to everything. So it's much different now. Well, we were raised that way too, though. You know, you're going to work hard. You're going to make money. You're going to have a family. You're going to live the life that you've always dreamed of. And they never really talked about how you were going to get there. And, you know, I mean, I did in college, I did some line work on a factory and I was literally bending transistor wires and putting them into the back of a circuit board for hours and hours and hours. And it was so hideously awful. But I was doing it because that was what I was taught I should do. Suck it up, yep. you know, just do it. Yep. And, and, and looking you know, and looking back on it now, you again, you go, what the hell was I thinking? That's that's no yeah. way to live. But we didn't know any better. We didn't, we know, didn't any know any better. And we also didn't have any options because any other job that we went to would have had the same mindset at the higher levels. There weren't a lot of jobs, you know, that were touchy feely until we got to like the early nineties. Remember that in Silicon Valley and all of TQM, a sudden were, TQM. Yep, yep. Oh my God. Yep. You know, then there were ping pong tables everywhere and you know, we Net had, pods. I, yeah. And we had food delivery. Yeah. And, we, we had nap pods too. It was the backseat of the company car parked in the back of the building <laughs> in the front. So, you know, that David Burkus puts this best and and uh, he admits he stole this from somebody else. And I can't remember who said it first, but, you know, all of these standards that we used to live by were were fine when we were in a manufacturing in, environment, when we were in a product based environment. Mm -hmm. Now we're we're work, we're almost all of us now are working in idea factories, not product factories. We're all knowledge based workers. And in order to be creative, in order to be thoughtful, in order to be mindful, there has to be some level of fulfillment. And otherwise, you know, there's no such thing as a group you create a person. It does not happen, <laughs> right? And and so we have to, to a certain extent, we have to 
enjoy our work now in order to fulfill mm. this idea economy promise. And, and I think that's a part of it. So, and that's why I also, um, you know, to get back to your original question, are millennials, do we give millennials credit for this? Yes, to a certain degree, but I also think our economy has changed so much from that product based manufacturing environment to the knowledge economy that I think that has just as much to do with it as, as what we expect from our leaders. Right. Right. Yeah. And I, I think that I like to think of it as the millennial mindset, because those of us who live and breathe social media marketing and are really active in digital, we still think that way. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have kind of a millennial mindset. I'm totally addicted to my gadgets. I'm very aware of who I work with and whether I want to work with them or not. Now, maybe that's something that happens when she hit 50, because I also noticed that once I hit 50, I was like, hey, I would don't like about you, if I don't like you, I'm not going to work with you. It's not worth the pain. Right. Right. But, you know, so well, 50 I, year millennial. <laughs> yeah, I, I call myself the, the the world's first 55 year old millennial. So I definitely get that. I, you know, I um, and I think it is a mindset, I think. And I think it's something that we can all learn from. I, I mean, I'm technically a boomer, but I have nothing in common with a 75 year old man. That's also a boomer. Nothing. And, yeah. And it's so I mean, I have an eight year old at home. It's like, hello. <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 Hello, no, Snapchat. no part of my life except the gray hair on my head makes me feel like I'm a boomer. Nothing. The yep. devices, the kids, the people I work with, the people I enjoy working for, and none of that has anything to do with what a what a typical boomer might might, you know, their life might be. And 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 so yeah, I think it is a mindset. Yeah. And I, I think it is a mindful mindset. And however we got there, you know, I think that mindfulness makes more sense. Um, and maybe, I don't know which came first, whether it's the chicken or the egg thing or not. I, I, I don't know. All I know is when I was 30, I mean, almost the day within a couple of weeks of turning 30, I threw my hands up in my cubicle and said, this sucks and I'm not doing it anymore. And I'm never living my life like this again. And I haven't, I started my own business. I, um, I still struggle sometimes today you know, 30 years later, and uh, it's okay. It's it's okay to live like that because I don't feel like I have to go to the same building, the same cubicle every day. I'm I'm I chose to live life on my terms, and I and I and I tend to be attracted to those who who do also whether it's a whether they're working in a corporate job or not, whether mm -hmm. they're you know independent or not. I I um I surround myself with genius, and that genius usually has more contemporary thoughts about how to lead and how to work and, and how to build relationships. Mm. So do you think that's part of being a mindful leader is really gathering the people around you who lift you up and that you can lift up as well? Oh, yes. I, the, I, we, boy, we talk about that all the time. It's, you know, you, you, you want to know how you're perceived, take a good, strong, objective look at the people you hang out with mm. most. Are, are they, are they trolls? Are they drama queens? Are they divas? Are they takers? Are they fakers? Are they assholes? You know, if they're any of those things, it's it, it probably reflects on you, and and it's a deliberate choice. And and it's by the way, it's a hard transition to make. When you, when I know when I made the conscious decision, starting starting with my first wife, to be perfectly honest, <laughs> that I was not going to live like that anymore. It was it was a major transition. It was. You know, but when you free yourself, when you're mindful enough to say, you know what, enough drama, enough, enough diva behavior. Let's let's start living life and and enjoying our work and and enjoying mm -hmm. the people around us and learn from those around us. It's quite liberating. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And having been through that more than once, <laughs> I you know, I mean, any kind of situation, whether you're leaving a partner, a spouse, a job, a school, any of those things, when you make the decision that, you know, I'm better than this and I don't need to put up with this and I'm going to make the conscious choice to change, even though, you know, as you said, it's going to hurt once in a while. Entrepreneurship is not an easy road. Uh, you know, I mean, I've had my company for 20 years, partly because I couldn't do the cube anymore. I just couldn't do it. And, you know, once you say, okay, I'm going to commit to that, there's going to be days that you're going to say, wow, I 
would love to go back to a cube right now and just cuddle up in a corner and get paid for it. But there, there are those days where that cubicle looks damn good. That, <laughs> uh, but, but then we come to our senses and go, yeah, it lasts a week. Or as somebody said in the chat, two hours. Um, yeah, yeah, Charlene said that. Yeah, and you know, honestly, I think I'm kind of unemployable now. I think I've reached the point where no one would really want to put me in a cube because I can't not talk back. It's just well, boy, it's so to... funny you say that because you know my business partner Sean Murphy and I we do a lot of consulting now for companies that are trying to adapt a more social mindset um, and build mm -hmm. socially enabled teams and and we walk through some of the companies that that we work for and we love and we see the difference we're making and we love that. But you spend four hours in those cubicle farms and we just look at each other sometimes and go. Oh my God! They would kill me. Mm. They would they'd, I, they would tar and feather me, and because I'd go nuts in here, I, you know, I I couldn't work like this. I couldn't think like this. And yeah. and I got to tell you, it's not just the cubicles. That whole open environment thing. Some of our some of our clients have this <laughs> open office thing. Oh, that would I, make me nuts I would be the biggest troll. I mean, that big long table full of people and laptops and, <laughs> and earbuds and stuff. I would be the biggest troll. In that entire table, I would go shut the hell up. I'm trying to think, and yeah, and it's yeah, it wouldn't work for me at all. So yeah, I don't, I don't know how people work in the open environment. I can't, I oh, they can't don't. do it. And the studies are showing that now. It's the yes. opposite of being mindful. It's the opposite of being able to focus on what we're supposed to be doing. Now, I just mentioned Sean Murphy. He says he would love working in an open environment because he's um, he's basically an introvert, but he thrives. His energy comes from listening talking collaborating mm. thinking with others where i just where i get my I, you know i i'm i'm a more devout introvert i i mean i love uh, these conversations i love what i do for a living but frankly i would much rather be on a fishing stream with my my kids and my dog and not have to talk to an adult right <laughs> uh, kids kids and dogs love me adults not so much and it's that's just the way i think and work and mm. so that open environment opposite of mindful and I don't get it at all. I don't I don't get how we function in that. I might get what Shelly Kramer calls getting stabby. Stabby? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that would be me. Would yeah, be me. I'm I'm quite an introvert myself and I think it, to some respect that helps with, you know, being mindful is that I like to go off and just think about what we're going to do and, you know, meditate on that and and really focus. Um but we're getting really off track with entrepreneurship as opposed to leadership. So we have to go back. Okay, and going back. I want you to define something for us that we haven't defined yet. And that what is the quality of active listening and how is that beneficial to conversation or leadership? Well, again, I, I blame the devices. I I blame in some cases the helicopter parents that, that, that first um, tolerated um, our device environment and then joined it um, to make things even worse. Uh, I think we became so addicted to digital that we forgot how to have a conversation. We forgot how to build mutually beneficial relationships. We, mm -hmm. we forgot how to enjoy the experience we're in right now. And, and that's what active listening helps us do. It, it, it says, I'm going to put the phone down. I'm going to put the tablet down. I'm, uh, yes, I still have work to do, but I'm going to have a good 20 minute conversation. And, and you and I've talked about this before, if, man, if it means that we let's have a 40 minute meeting instead of a 60 minute meeting, but let's really focus on this challenge right now, this opportunity right now, all of us, you know, put the, put the phones in the middle of the table, face down. Don't, mm -hmm. you know, let's just, let's just have a conversation, especially from leaders. Uh, you know, leaders, leaders, again, who used to be so autocratic, they, they didn't have to listen. They, they could they could be doing other things. They could be answering email while everybody else was was chatting and, and worshiping the problem. We didn't have to be focused on a solution because we had all the answers. Mm. Right? And, and it's the world's not like that. So, you know, uh, Steve Levy says it best. You have you have two ear, two ears and one mouth. Use them proportionally. And 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 actually, you know, and a big part of this active listening thing, Janet, is. Are you asking the right questions, mm. right? And 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 you as leader, that's your job now. You're basically chief facilitation officer, right? You can where before we just had we just you know we were supposed to have all the answers. Now a good leader has all the questions. You can state the problem, state the challenge, state the opportunity, 
and then look around the room and go, what do you got? What, right. You know, let's, 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 um, let's take some turns. Let's, let's really, you know, and the best thing about that is once everybody starts active listening, the first idea thrown on the, on the table, even if it's by the, you know, not the opposite of uh, HIPPO, uh, uh, an acronym for highest, um, highest paid person in the room opinion, right? It used to be in the, in the industrial age, we would just, okay, he's the VP, he wins. Right? Mm -hmm. Now, if we're all active listening, it's, it's, it's about, it's, it's a more about, let's take that idea and make it bigger, make it better. Um, filter it down a little bit. Um, consider the, consider all angles. Maybe it sounds like a good idea. And we do this all the time at switch and shift and U-turn. We'll come up with something and go, oh God, that's a great idea. And then when we really start to think about it, you go, yeah, that's not such really, that's not such a great idea. <laughs> right. So it's, it's, that's active listening is, is being present, being being ready, being open to new ideas and new thoughts, um, and and not having it be all about you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think another part of active listening too is listening to actually hear what the person's saying instead of plan what you're going to say next to counter whatever it is that you think that they're going to say without even paying any attention to what you what they really are saying. I mean, actually listening. Well, that's you know, isn't that an industrial age phenomenon that we that that, that we've that we've that we've um, tortured ourselves to learn for decades mm. that we have to be the smartest person in the room, that we have to have the best comeback, that we have to have the the best idea, and and that's and that's where um, not not listening to hear, but listening to to activate your next thought process, what comes out of your mouth next, that's a huge issue and. And and by the way, it isn't just it isn't just in that conversation. It's it's everywhere. It's you know if you're answering email, if you're you know, uh, and you've missed half the conversation, and now you go, oh, it's my turn to talk. You you've you've missed the boat. You're you just killed the entire conversation. Mm -hmm. You killed all the momentum, and it's it's tough. It's really tough. Yeah, yeah, and it, it it's so common. And you know, I mean, I think we're all guilty of it. I know I'm guilty of it. Um, maybe because I can't keep that thought long enough until you're done talking. And, you know, that's doesn't matter. If I was actually listening to you and present in the moment, then my response to what you said would be a natural response instead of something that's maybe a little disconnected. Um, I used to tell a story about my mom that she was a listener. She was a very active listener. And when anybody had a conversation with her, she didn't say much. But when that woman opened her mouth, everybody just bowed down and she was brilliant. It was awesome. And I've never been able to do it myself. <laughs> yes, yes, you have. And I've seen you do it. So there. I've Thank seen you, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> it is a real skill that, you know, people have. And I think that there are a lot of leaders who listen a lot more than we think they are. And then later they'll call you in the office and go, you know, yeah. we need to talk about this. Well, you know, uh, here's another point that we we, 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 I think it would be a mistake not to bring it up is what we're talking about isn't a work, this is not a workplace issue like you and I've talked about before. This is a human issue. Yes. And when, you know, um, when I'm talking to, to Sean or Amy or, or Lauren or Dave or, you know, Zach or anybody from my team, and and I'm taking notes on the computer as they're talking, so I don't forget something important. And you know, I, I can I can get away with that to a certain extent anyway. If I do it to my eight year old, the eight year old will like grab me by the chin. I'm dead over here talking to you, right? Good for and, him. And he knows. He knows. You tweeted that last right? night, which I I really appreciated when uh, you know we were talking about that on H to H, and you were like, "Yeah, my horse is the same way. You know, what? you aren't paying attention on yep. a horse, you're gonna be really sorry." Yep. Right. So it's, it's very much a human thing. It's very much a, a dad thing, a mom thing, a sister thing, a brother thing, a son mm -hmm. thing. Um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's something we've lost in, in, in this digital world we live in. It's something we've lost is that ability to make eye contact and, yeah. and actually have a decent conversation and it's coming back and it's, and it's coming back in a big way. Um, you know, I used to take notes on my laptop everywhere I went. The, there was always a laptop screen between me and and the person um, in front of me, and mm -hmm. and I'm trying very hard now not to do that. I'm trying to learn from 
from Sean who who tried he tried to convert to my he tried to come to the dark side and 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 use um, his iPad for taking notes and now he's right back to his journals again so mm. um, you know it's it's uh, even those of us who who talk a lot about active listening we still have that device in our pockets we can still feel the vibration we still have our laptops we still want to go look up a file as we're having a conversation yeah. this is not an easy path to take but but it's an important one. Yeah, it, it definitely is. And I think it's also really important to understand that this is this is something that we learn better when we're actually writing with our hand than when we type on a computer. There have been studies done that said actually putting things on paper with your hand sticks more than it does putting it on a computer because you're distracted by the computer or the device. So, you know, um, Sean asks the question, should we ask people not to take notes on an electronic that's, device? That's for my benefit, Sean. Presence? I know why you asked that question. Uh, I totally agree with him. So. Well, well, so do I. Uh, <laughs> here's the, here's the, you know, especially for those of us who work for ourselves and sometimes by ourselves, mm -hmm. we, you know, I don't know what you, I'm in an air, on an airplane a lot and I, and I don't sit in the office and I don't have the same cubicle and, and and so everything about me has to be portable and and so i don't do paper but um but now now i'm learning i mm. um i keep i keep a journal i keep my note taking to a minimum and and it is helping uh should we ask other people i have no trouble at all sitting down in a room matter of fact i'll, I'll tell you a story really quick we we had we had a, a brand new client eight brand new direct reports of a CIO at a major company. They had never met each other. Well, three of them had, but but the other five had not. They had never sat in the same room together. This was the senior leadership team of a major corporation. They'd never sat in the same room together. Mm -hmm. They all sat around the conference room with their noses in their device and in their laptops. They didn't say one word to each other until the CIO finally showed up. And I looked at him and went, do you see what's going on here? How are you going to build a team? How are you going to build empathy if we can't have a conversation? We're so busy wrapping everything we can up before this meeting starts that we're not in the moment right now. Mm -hmm. We start a conversation. And to his credit, he did. And, and it turned out to be a great meeting. But, but I, you know, I was there early and I saw this going on. I went, oh, my God, we are in trouble. We are. I mean, there was no attempt at all to have a human-to-human -human conversation. And it was frightening. Yeah, yeah, that really is. It's really distressing when, you know, if they're so disconnected, how are you ever going to get them to connect? You can't do it. Well, you can't. And, and if you do, they're going to come at it from the same position they've always come from. You know, um, it's not my fault. It's infrastructure. No, it's not infrastructure's fault. It's architecture. Well, if the apps would ever show up on time, architecture would be fine. And we, we, we turn into protectionism mode, right? Defending what's ours. Defending mm -hmm. what we know instead of saying apps, what? How can we help you? Are there resources that we can send your way for a week or two to help get these apps on, uh, done on time? What can we do, right? Mm -hmm. and, and stop worshiping the problem and start focusing on the solution. And that's that's the that's the big deal. Is 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 how do how do we make that happen? And that's that's where a leader becomes chief facilitation officer and 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 leads the conversation in a, in a productive manner. I may have to change my title. <laughs> it's all yours. It's just a nickel every time you use it. That's all. Oh, okay. <laughs> Only a nickel. You know, I missed a question. Charlene asked what the difference is between mindful social leadership and mindful leadership. So I, we've talked about this before, but social leadership or leadership, What's the difference? Well, I think social is our, uh, many of us are using social leadership or social leader um, as, as a way to differentiate ourselves from what we learned in business school in the 70s. Um, we, got, we have a couple of names for it. We, we call it old white man disease. And, <laughs> and when we say old white man, we really mean it because women don't seem to have these problems. Um, you know, women are better listeners, I think, in general. Um, again, hard to lump that that many millions of people all into one composite person but 
Um, it's mostly the men who seem to have this idea, this ego that they have to be this autocratic, loud leader. Um, women right. don't seem to have that problem as much. But um, then they tell women, you know, step up, act like a man. Well, women are, we, <laughs> my wife is a rocket scientist. She tells me all the time that women are our own worst enemies sometimes when it comes mm -hmm. to this stuff. So you're right. Um, we also refer to the social leader because they are still so rare. And a full credit to Jim Clausen and IBM for this. It, it's his notion. Uh, we refer to them as blue unicorns. I mean, they're, they're, we're, so many of us are still managers instead of mentors and compliance officers instead of uh, creativity builders uh, that, that um, the social leader is rare. And, it's, and he says blue unicorns. We asked him, What's a, what the hell's a blue unicorn? He said, well, I'm not just looking for a unicorn as if that's not rare enough. I'm looking for a specific color of unicorn. That's how rare the social leader is. So, so Charlene, we, we, we differentiate that to, to let people know that we are trying, we expect from ourselves to be better, act, uh, better active listeners, to be more mindful, to be more present, to, to listen to the wisdom in the room better, to not have to have all the answers. And um, again, it's pretty liberating. It's, it's a, it's a great way to lead instead of, instead of feeling all that pressure. Yeah, that's an interesting point too, uh, you know, about the pressure that there is um, a desire not to be vulnerable, that they feel le a lot of leaders feel that being vulnerable is a weakness and really, you know, opening yourself up to that vulnerability and saying, okay, I'm not an engineer. I don't have the answers to these questions, but I got the people that do. So let's talk to them. Well, yeah, that well, that's a big deal, right? I mean, at, at another client, we had a, a major problem on the assembly floor, and we walked in to facilitate a solution, and it was all suits. It was it was eleven men, one woman, all VPs and up, and and we just looked around the room. Well, where's where's manufacturing? Where's assembly? Where's where's the, where's quality control? I said, well, we we're we we're manage all that. We're that's that's all under our domain. So we're here. I like, know we got we have to have the right people in the right room at the right time. Hmm. And and when a leader finally realizes that and 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 beyond that, they don't just invite them to a meeting, but they actually start walking the floor. They actually start go, you know, passing the people in the hallways and having random acts of leadership and just being a human being and being vulnerable. It's it's exhilarating. It's uh, people, I mean, we we have a client where where we, we had a mid-level manager come up and go, you're not going to believe this. I just had this great conversation with the name of VP here, and and it was in the hallway. It was outside the women's room, and it was the best conversation I've ever had with her. And I just mm -hmm. learned more in seven minutes than, than I have in seven months about what we're doing here and why it's important. And and it's 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 exhilarating when you when you hit that point. It's a great way to really inspire loyalty. And I think it also makes the workforce happier because they feel more vested. If the workforce feels like they're the workforce, you know, that they're isolated and they go just, you know, point bend the little wires and put the transistors in the boards, then, you know, they're, they're not going to feel vested. And it's just, you know, I'm going to go out drinking after this. <laughs> Well, that's that's why God made happy hour. What you just described, is. right? Is and when and by the way, you you may be the perfect um, test case for this. When did a VP ever walk down and walk behind you, put your put his hand or her hand on your shoulder and say, "How's it going today?" Yeah, never, never, right? Never, ever. Now, if a leader does that now and just says, "Hey, you know what? I um, I left late last night, late last night too. I saw your car in the parking lot." Hey, what's going on? What can I help with? Mm. You know, what, cha what challenge kept you here that late last night? And just ask the question and this pressure, this stress, just you can see it leaving people's bodies because you're actually asking a sincere question and you, and you're offering to help. And, and it's, it's just, it's just amazing. It's huge. And it's just being human. Well, that's it, right? No hierarchy, no silos. It's like, I saw I saw your car here late last night, man. What's up? Yeah. Right. That's yeah. it. That's all it takes. You know, eleven words and boom, we're out the door. And and now we're having a human to human conversation, and we're and we're bringing the human side of business back into the operation. And now people people feel better about their work. They mm. they know you care. They they want to work harder. They want to be part of the solution. And and it just that's that's the difference between 
mindful leadership and mindful social leadership is you are deliberately walking up to people in a social way and, and engaging. And that's, that's what's different, I think. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I, I think, too, you know, there's a lot of benefit to it in that, for example, that person who stayed up all night may be working on a problem that the engineers or the management team don't know about yet something that could be nipped in the bud instead of waiting until it blows up and you're starting to get tweets about, you know, how bad your product is when it could have been fixed if anybody would have taken the time to listen. Well, so. it wouldn't that be amazing, right? To, to, to have a, some kind of an escalation process that comes from those random acts of leadership. It's mm -hmm. like, look, you don't have to do this on your own. We got this. Let's get the right people in the room. Let's fix this right now. All hands yeah. on deck. I, I got your back. Let's go. And it's, it's, um, it makes a world of difference. And it's a good way too to um, show the mid level managers, you know, when the CEO talks to that line worker and finds a problem and takes it to the mid level manager and goes, look, we had a conversation. You haven't had that conversation yet. So let's have it now. And I'll show you by leading how to actually have these conversations more often without saying that explicitly. Well, it's one of the most exciting things about social leadership is, you know, like TQM, like we mentioned earlier, like many of the other movements around leadership, um, you know, going back to the 40s and 50s of last century, it was always top down. It was always, mm -hmm. you know, to improve manufacturing, to improve profits, to improve quality. It wasn't to improve the work force. It wasn't to improve the work environment. It usually wasn't to change culture. That's a fairly new phenomenon. It was always about one side and one side only, and that's something to benefit the company, right? And mm -hmm. and with social leadership, we, we can lead from anywhere. We don't have to have the title. We don't have to have the right business card. That person on the assembly can go to that middle manager and go, we have a problem. Mm -hmm. right? And I, and I have, I, I've thought about it. I have the solution, but I but I need to I need to confer with the, her and him and her and her and him, and let's get on this. And you're leading from out front, mm -hmm. and you're not waiting for the VP or the EVP or the CEO to get involved. And it, wouldn't it be fun to go to the CEO and go, look, we had this, you know, we had this issue today. Um, it's fixed. Mm. Instead of oh my God, the call center is down again. The average wait time is 53 minutes. It's been like that for three days. People are screaming at us on Twitter and Facebook and, and, and you know, sending us nasty pictures on Instagram, you know, with middle fingers fully extended and, you know, help, right? That's mm -hmm. a, it's a whole different world. And it's going to take us four times as long to fix it. Uh, yeah, because now it's entrenched, right? right. So it's, it's now the pressure's there and it's, it's, we're not thinking of things creatively. We're thinking of it because we have to, and that's, mm -hmm. that's a whole different thing. Another, another great thing about social leadership and Sean, Sean uses this in his book, The Optimistic Workplace. He talks a lot about pockets of excellence and how we don't have to wait for that top down, you know, manifesto. That, mm -hmm. that we can, let's just say you're a junior leader, maybe maybe even right out of college. Maybe you're leading in a team of interns, but you come up with a better way of doing things and you do it, people are going to notice. Right. People are going to say, wait a minute, you just finished that six-week project in three and a half weeks? How did you do that? Because <laughs> I didn't have to go through all the crap that I usually have to right? go through. And, and so, so you build these pockets of excellence mm. that people notice and then what whatever that pocket of excellence was doing, that becomes the norm. And it didn't take a mandate. It didn't take a manifesto. It didn't take any top-down leadership. Stuff just started happening because mm -hmm. people owned it and, and took the lead and, and took the lead without permission. So then when we look at it again as social leadership, really social leadership is leading by community. Oh, it is. That's, that's a great way to look at it. It's, it's, um, it's, it's almost taking turns. Right. Mm. Um, and, and this is why I like I deliberately choose to surround myself with genius because I I don't like having to have all the answers. Right. I have five kids and two grandkids and I coach high school football and high school baseball and I run three companies and and I have every opportunity in the world to be a raging autocrat. And and I don't want to do that when I have to solve a problem. 
Yeah. Right. I, I, I love, uh, you know, calling one of my teammates or a networking friend or, or somebody who's really good at this one niche. Right. And that's what my client needs right now is this expertise. And I have this huge open circle open is an acronym from our book, um, ordinary person, extraordinary network. And I can go to my open circle and bring in any number of experts to fix this exact problem. Uh, you know, this, that's, that's, um, that's pretty exciting that, that we can, that we can call on each other. And, and, um, as you said, lead, lead, not just lead by community, but meet challenges by community, rise up to opportunities by community, um, problem solved by community. I it's, that's good stuff. To me, that's one of the real huge benefits of social media today, because, you know, now we have these extended networks we don't have to know everything about everything because there's somebody out there. If you put a post out and say, I don't know how to do this, somebody's going to help you with that. And, you know, for me, that's part of, you know, with being mindful about social media, it's about the generosity part. You know, if somebody has a question, I'm going to Google it if I have to get to get the answer. Um, or I'm going to reach out to some of my network to get the answer and introduce the people with the problem. And, um, I think we can do the same thing within companies as well. Oh, we can. Um, we talk a lot about relentless givers. Um, you know, we took we took Adam Grant's theory of um, movers. Or I'm sorry, um, matchers, givers, and takers. Mm. And you know, um, a, a, a taker is somebody who doesn't necessarily believe very much in giving. It's all about them. Um, a matcher is somebody who will give, but usually only if if something's in it for them mm -hmm. deliberately, like they can consciously feel that, see that. And a giver is somebody who says, look, I, I have a certain set of expertise. I, I have my own set of genius and, and I'm willing to share that. And I'm going to make those around me stronger and better and, and, and problem solve faster. And, and it's those relentless givers that we really want to hang around with. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, and that's what you see. I mean, in the leadership space, uh, as you know, there's probably, you know, three or 400 people. That's why you and I keep running on each other once a year in San Francisco you know, there's there's a group of us that we know and we trust and we love, and we've never even met some of them, some of them yet physically. We've never shaken their hand, mm -hmm. and even when we do shake their hand, we know them so well now. It's it's more of a hug than it is a you know a handshake, right? Mm -hmm. And but we trust each other, and and we can call on each other, and and we and we're not matchers, and we're not takers. We're 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 in this for the long haul, and we're here to make everybody around us better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely true, and and it is really interesting because you know a lot of people are really obsessed with how many followers they have or how many connections they have but that to me isn't as important as the quality of the connections that you have and the quality of the people that you surround yourself with both for your own self-worth and for your value to the community you know if if you surround yourself with anybody who will follow you well are they going to help right. you in the yeah. end? Oh. Well, and but that's you know, if phase one of social media, well before social leadership kicked in, was was I need to collect as many followers. It's a it's a vanity metric, right? And and we cared about numbers and metrics and and you know um, false celebrity and and boy, it wasn't it wasn't our job to fix anything. It wasn't our job to lead anything. It was our job to collect as many contacts as we could on on the major social media platforms. And thank God that's behind us now. Yeah, mostly. I mean, we well, we filter them out, right? If somebody's mm -hmm. going to be, a, uh, if somebody with no eth work ethic, and but but loves being the Twitter celebrity, you're gonna you're gonna quickly filter that that person out. You're gonna mm -hmm. say this isn't somebody, this isn't this isn't somebody I want in my open circles. This is this is somebody that's not going to be there when I you know when I have a client or when I have a situation that I need help with. Um, they're they're after themselves. They're out for themselves, and I. Yeah, I'm not going to hang out with them very much, and we filter them out. All of us do, you mm -hmm. know, in, in varying degrees of of, um, of tolerance. But we we filter those people out, and and you know, the same with the spammers and the DMers and the you know all that stuff on social media. It's like, no, that's not how I'm going to give that, that man that, some props, people. That 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 does <laughs> that does not make me want to buy from you. Quite the opposite. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm going to hit unsubscribe as fast as I can, or I'm going to unfollow you as fast as I can. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, that's, that's the opposite of being mindful. It's the opposite of relationship building. And, and, and we, we, we now phase two of social media, we know better. 
Right. We know not to follow the Twitter celebrities. We, I'd much rather follow somebody with 300 followers that has something unique and powerful to say than follow somebody with 450,000 followers that never has an original thing to say in their life. It's mm -hmm. all, it's all echo chamber and, and minor bird stuff. So it's, it's, it's the givers I want to hang out with, whether they're celebrities or not, whether they're popular or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely true. Walter has a nice quote in the comments. He says, I find it's the givers that have the most recommendation that will have the most recommendations to others. And I think that's really true. You know, if you're generous to me, then I'm obviously going to be generous back to you. And, you know, if you need help in your network or you know somebody who needs help, I'm going to be much more willing to reach out to you than somebody that spams me every day and then asks for something. Eh, not so much. Yeah. Those LinkedIn, you know, you haven't responded to my emails yet. Yeah, I am not going to respond. And that's never that. going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> that is never going to happen. Well, I, um, you know, I stumbled in a, a lot into my social media world. I, I say this a lot of time, but the only thing I knew about social media at 50 years old was was my um, my oldest son on Facebook with talking to his girlfriend instead of doing his homework. And I remember just losing it. It's like, shut that damn computer down. Get on your homework. What are you thinking? You'll never touch Facebook again. Right? <laughs> Talk about an autocrat, right? And so I knew nothing. But the best thing I did when I finally, when we launched U-Turn, we had no choice. All of our customers were on social media. I had to be on social media. I had to learn how this thing worked. The best thing I ever did was start to hang around with people like Tim McDonald, like Mark Carter, like Kari Anderson, and and build a relationship and introduce them to people I knew. And, and, and um, usually after they, you know, they, uh, Tim McDonald would look at me and go, you know who you really need to talk to, mm. right? And then I'd have six introductions in, in LinkedIn or in my email. And, and that's how the world works is, is, you know, we live very much in the testimonial economy now. And if you're not getting referrals, if, you're, if people aren't sending work or thoughts or questions or people your way, you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. right? There, 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 there needs to be that that mutuality, as Carrie Anderson says. That says we're going to grow together, and we're going to we're going to take care of each other, and and we're going to invite new people in all the time as they earn our respect, as they as they come up with something original to say. Our open circles just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and so does our sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and that's that's a valuable lesson for the next generation. And it kind of leads to Randy's question. Uh, you know, he says, what advice do you have for graduating seniors that want to be leaders in digital so social organizations? And I think that's kind of a really good start to that is building your relationships in an intelligent way. Well, the first thing I'd tell Randy is just remove the word digital and social. I mean, pretty soon we're going to start, we're going to stop mm -hmm. talking about social marketing and social leadership. And it's just be marketing and it's just going to be leadership and there's there is nothing there's nothing um uh, right now social is an adjective right um but it's it's leaving us and it's and it's already happening and and so uh randy i looked i talked a little bit about it before um you know build your own pocket of excellence do something do something freaking amazing right don't brag about it just wait for somebody to notice and then and then soon you'll have You'll, you'll have you'll have your champions. You'll have your advocates saying, "Look, this guy's got it." Right. Um, the second thing is, don't ever, 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 ever wait to lead for to to get permission to lead. You know, you see a problem, you see a um, you, you know, you see the right the right opportunity, go for it. Don't um, you know this whole chain of command thing where you see a problem and you have to run to your manager? I that uh, I would like to see those days go well past us. I. Um, I love it when one of my team members comes to me and says, so we had we had a troll on social media. Here's what we did to, to fix it. Just want to let you know in case you get a back channel thought or something. And mm -hmm. they just own it, right? They, 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 they just took care of it. And, and that's, um, that's amazing to me, especially when somebody fresh out of college does that and shows that sense of ownership shows that sense of leadership, then, then boy, I'm, I'm now your, your best friend and your biggest champion. Yeah. Yeah. And Randy agrees. He says in the, in the chat, own it. And yeah, absolutely. You know, that taking charge is something that, you know, they really need to learn to do. And, you know, I have a son that's, he's 16 now 
and you know high school age they're not really owning it yet and so at what point how can we how can we lead them into going to college or even if they do to go to college which i'm not really in support of as much anymore uh you know how do we teach them that okay it's time now for you to start taking some ownership of the, some things so when you go into the workforce you're going to be ready to do that instead of just being a follower well at, at u-turn we've learned there's there's one key to the the question you just asked and that's getting the hell out of the classroom whether <laughs> you're in high school or college you have to get in a real world environment somewhere mm. um, apprenticeship internships job shadowing um hanging out with your with your parents in their work environment not only do you see a whole different side of your parents you actually see what it takes to survive in in the workplace and mm -hmm. and you know volunteer oh my god find a cause you care about and then and then i'm gonna get in a lot of trouble with this don't even ask your parents for permission if you're over 16 then say hey mom i'm i saturday morning i'm volunteering at the at the local food bank i i think it's the right thing to do there's mm -hmm. not a parent in the world that was oh no you're not right um <laughs> just you just you got to get out of the classroom you got to you got to get away from theory you got to get away from us old farts who want to tell you how to do everything mm -hmm. and protect you from ever making a mistake and you have to go out and f something up so bad you don't know what to do about it anymore because you're going to find a solution and that's how you're going to learn and and this is where yeah, i blame yeah. this is where i blame the helicopter parents right because we 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 over protect so so much that we don't we're not allowing we're not allowing our 16 18 22 25 28 year olds to, to, to build their own life and to face their own challenges and it's 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 frustrating for me so yeah get out get out of the classroom go do something go do something amazing yeah because otherwise you're not going to survive in the wild that's what we say <laughs> Well, and you know what? And nobody, uh, we, you know, we started um, our first sentence today was nobody cares about your college degree anymore. 81% of, of our young talent is going to college now. Who cares? It's like, mm. it's like a high school degree used to be, um, or a high school diploma used to be in the, you know, 80s and 90s. You couldn't get a job without a, without a college degree. Well, it's a, it's, it's a minimum point of entry now. It's, mm. It doesn't make you special. It doesn't help you get a job. It doesn't make you more employable. We've we've the statistics have shown that over and over again. In some cases, all it does is you're still just as employable as you were six years ago, but now you have one hundred and ten thousand dollars in student loan debt, yeah. right? You have to get out and learn something. You have to get out and do something. That's the key. Yeah, and I think a lot of um, kids use college as a way to continue the lifestyle that they're living straight out of high school. You know, or to make it a bridge. But, you know, the ones who have, you know, finished high school and dropped out of college in the first six months, Steve Jobs, you know, there's a lot of great examples of brilliant people, but also a lot of great examples of just regular everyday people who went, you know, I just don't want to do that. And really, I think if you can teach yourself a skill that you like and that you're passionate about and carry that over into your job, then you don't really need the degree anymore. Well, it's, you know, so there, there are, as you know, there are some professions, try to be a doctor without a degree, doesn't work sure. out very well, try to be an attorney without a degree, that's, you're not going to get very far that way. But for the most part, especially in the humanities, mm -hmm. and, and in the arts, uh, digital media, social media, um, degrees are not required anymore. And we have to rethink that we, you know, we have to rethink the way we've been raising our kids. Uh, mm -hmm. We call it, we call it the big lie, you, you know, go to high school, get decent grades, um, show some leadership, do some community service, go to college, get your, get your degree. There's going to be this great job in a, in a, a three bedroom house with a, with a dog and a cat. And, and that's just bullshit. That's that is definitely bullshit that it just doesn't work like that anymore. And, and we all have to find our own way. And, and the other thing we're learning, um, as you know, Janet is we all learn differently. We all absorb differently. We all think differently for one person. They may need that six year degree from Harvard. Other people can go with the same thing in, in 11 weeks at Code Academy or mm -hmm. Coursera. And, and so however it is you learn, however it is you thrive, go do that. And, oh, and, and that. You, you just, you, you, again, you, you just have to, what works for you, it, by the way, parents, again, worst career counselors in the world. They send you to college because it's a parent badge of honors, like a parent merit badge. Oh, my, my son is at Stanford. Who gives a crap? where your son went to school. Is he happy? 
Is he is he raising good kids of his own? Is are, is is she enjoying life? Is she living? What makes what you know what helps her get out of bed in the morning? Is she just drudging off to work every day? And mm -hmm. and is she miserable? And it's so it, it's we have to change the way we we think about the whole the whole system. I think. And by the way, all of this gets us back into this mindful approach, right? If we actually care about the work we're doing, we're so much more mindful. We're so much more appreciative. We're so much more present in in the work that we're doing rather than just doing it for a paycheck. And, and you yeah, know, and just tuning out. We've learned that lesson, I hope, and we're moving on. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's very true, and and we're seeing it more and more now. We're seeing a lot more people who are younger and moving up really fast because they have that. They take that mindful approach and really put it to use and hook it into their passion. And oh my gosh, they take off like mad. And it's not so much an age thing as it is just being able to let yourself go and do what your passion is and follow your heart. And, it, well, and I got to tell you, Jenna, along the way, the people that are doing that, they're scaring the poop out of those old white men. They, they, <laughs> they see Rightfully this coming. So. They see this tsunami of change coming and it's coming straight at them and it just locks them up. It just scares the hell out of them. Oh yeah. Because yeah. you know, they, they went to school six, eight years. They, they spent 30 years paying their dues and now, Here's this guy, 31 years old, running a company that just got funded for $40 million, and he doesn't even have a college degree. It upsets <laughs> everything they know. It's mm -hmm. it's That's some scary stuff. Randy, you're making me laugh. Yeah, it's totally it's totally true, and, and business has changed, but that doesn't mean that the old white guys can't change with it. Oh, you know, God, It doesn't no. mean that they can't change their mindset with a very small mindset, just open their mind. And when we talk about mindfulness, one thing that I want to say before we close is mindfulness isn't about meditation and all that airy fairy stuff people say, you know, about it. Mindfulness is simply about paying attention and being present and giving a shit about the rest of the world. It isn't any more than that. It's that simple. And if people could just take that with them into the way they work, and especially for me, into how they market, the whole world would change. It would be so cool. <laughs> Isn't it funny what happens when we stop caring about only ourselves? Mm. Mm. Absolutely true. I would love to go on and on and, and on. And you and I could. But... And we could. <laughs> but I only gave us an hour. And so before we go, Mark, why don't you recap uh, where people can find you and especially about U-Turn and your new project as well? Well, uh, U-Turn is uh, U-Turn.com, Y-O-U-T-E-R-N, like you intern combined. Um, uh, please visit us there. And brand new site coming up in about a, a month we're quite excited about. Um, if you're really interested in social leadership, um, and building that optimistic workplace, um, visit us at switchandshift.com. The end is all spelled out. Um, that's, uh, that's where I hang out with Sean Murphy and our great crew over there. And the new organization is forwardheroes.org. Um, it's not launched yet. It, um, it'll probably, probably start seeing more about that in, in June. We're working with, uh, with our own government and, and uh, many veterans to, to make that a reality. Wow, that's so cool. I have somebody. You, do you know Frank Strong? I, well, I know of Frank. I haven't met Frank yet. You need to meet Frank. See, we're connecting. He's he's absolutely awesome. He'd, he'd be a really good person for you to talk I'd to. I'd be honored to meet okay. him. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. We had such great comments. And, you know, I'm going to put the replay. will be live on Blab. It'll be on mindfulsocialmarketing.com. It'll be on my podcast. It'll be on YouTube. I'll put it on Twitter. We'll just mark the crap out of this because Mark, <laughs> you've been fabulous. Thank you. And Jenna. I really appreciate it. And I'm so honored to be here. Thank you. Oh, thank you.